So uh, thank you for coming to the uh, philanthropy breakout. How many people snuck in? <laughs> out. <laughs> Get out. So um, we have some, uh, you, if you saw the breakout this morning, I won't do long introductions because you saw my introductions of folks. We're going to go in um, very imaginatively alphabetical order. So uh, leading off will be Charles Best. Pe I told people to take like 12 or so minutes, take a couple of questions, but I think some of us are shorter than that, which is good, because we'd love to have a conversation at the end about bigger issues and take more questions and things like that. So we won't be super tight on timing and, and things like that. Uh, OK, so without um, further ado, Charles Best. OK, cool. Hey there, uh, Mike, thank you so much. Um, all right, let me jump right into it and see if we can give back a couple minutes of time to your Q&A. Uh, so hopefully uh, some of you are familiar with DonorsChoose.org. We got started 16 years ago, years before crowdfunding was a word, but you could think of us as Kickstarter for public school teachers, especially those in low-income communities. Uh, and here's why we hope that uh, you'll uh, start rocking out on our data. Uh, in short, it's because teachers at two-thirds of all the public schools in America have created uh, more than a million classroom project requests on our site. These are the, I'm not going to read the stats on the slide, so I'm telling you a couple of, of stats that are not on the slide. Uh, and so we feel like we have statistical significance for the resources that teachers most need in particular cities and states. The books that middle school teachers in low-income communities think are most effective at getting kids hooked on reading. Uh, the fact that middle school math teachers have concluded that uh, doing recipes is a great way uh, to teach math concepts, and it's why they're requesting a lot of cooking equipment on our site. Our big dream uh, is to one day influence billions of dollars of government education spending, make it smarter, better targeted, more efficient, more responsive, because uh, people can now listen to classroom teachers and what those teachers are trying to tell the powers that be about what resources they most need, what topics are trending in their minds, what activities are most effective. So that's sort of the, the general call to action to, to each of you. Um, and I'll share just a few um, fun studies that our data science team did after opening up all of our data. Uh, so if you go to data.donorschoose.org, uh, you'd be capable of running any of the uh, following uh, fun little uh, insights and analyses we did. Uh, first, we found that um, women donors, 80% of our, 79% of our donors are female. And uh, when we looked at the, their distribution of giving over the course of a year, we saw that uh, women tend to give to classroom projects over the course of a school year, whereas men tend to donate to classroom projects on holidays and special occasions. And this has nothing to do with being at work or not being at work. Uh, 10.30 a.m. is uh, the highest point of giving on our site. Uh, and many people think that's because uh, you've gotten to work, uh, you've had your coffee, now you're doing like that first stop off at uh, a news website and, and you're giving to a project. So our hypothesis was that altruism comes naturally to women, but men need an external stimulus to remind them to be philanthropic uh, in, the course, in the case of uh, that day. Um, we found that uh, people with certain <laughs> astrological signs uh, have very different giving patterns in terms of the size of their donation uh, and the frequency of their giving, um, and it's, it's statistically significant. And we have no hypothesis as to uh, like what's what's behind this. Um, now I want to. Uh, Deb and I were talking about. Uh, the, the, um, some of the studies, including one, showing that you're much more likely to donate to hurricane relief if the first letter of that hurricane is the same first letter as your name. Uh, so seeing that study, we, we were inspired uh, to randomly assign our donors to three different poems on Valentine's Day. Uh, the first poem said, roses are red, violets are blue, we heart this teacher and hope you do too. And we would show uh, a compelling classroom project request right underneath that poem, chosen based on our urgency algorithm, which uh, tries to identify uh, the most compelling and also the most time-sensitive project on our site. Uh, donors uh, might also have been randomly assigned to get a geo-targeted poem. Roses are red, violets are blue, give to a teacher in a classroom near you. And we would then display a classroom project uh, that might be just half a mile or a mile away from your IP address or your billing zip code. The, the classic, what, what ought to be the most powerful, hyper-local geo-targeting. But the third poem 
uh, said, roses are red, violets are blue, give to a teacher with the same name as you. And we would then show uh, a classroom project from a teacher uh, sharing your last name. Uh, and it was that poem which just like destroyed uh, the other two poems in terms of open rate, conversion rate, etc. The, the geo-targeted poem uh, performed substantially better than the first just kind of generic, here's a cool project poem. But the um, name matching poem was like 200% better than geotargeting, right? And geotargeting is supposed to be like the holy grail of personalization and customization, but we found that uh, enabling a donor uh, uh, to see themselves in a micro giving opportunity was far more powerful. Uh, and we're really excited. We, we now um, match donors and teachers up based on sharing a birthday. Uh, so if you're a donor and you've decided to leave your birthday during the checkout flow on our site, uh, we wish you a happy birthday by showing you a classroom project from a teacher who's, uh, who has the very same birthday as you. Okay, let's get just a little more serious. Um, this is, uh, you don't need to make out the numbers on this slide, but it was an analysis of the impact of the recession on low income versus upper income public schools. And what we found was that after the recession hit, um, in low income schools, the proportion of requests for really basic materials, like copy paper and pencils and dictionaries, shot upward as compared to the proportion of requests seeking enrichment resources, like butterfly cocoons or owl pellets or a field trip to Washington, D.C. to see the Supreme Court consider a case. Whereas in upper income public schools, the recession led to no such increase in the proportion of requests for really basic materials. And so in these classroom projects, you had manifest the, the regressive disparate impact of the recession, uh, which uh, our data indicates left kids in low income public schools without basic materials like books and paper and pencils, whereas kids in upper income communities who may, whose schools may have still been struggling, nevertheless had the basics in their classrooms. So the final um, uh, study I want to show you, uh, we did uh, with Mike. And um, this was based on our hope that donors choose uh, not only could help to change the system, and, and just backing up for a second, a lot of people knock donors choose as being uh, a band-aid solution on the theory that we address symptoms but not causes of educational inequity. And we've got a little bit of a chip on our shoulder about that because we think that crowdfunding generally and donors choose specifically can actually be a force for changing the system itself. One way is by opening up our data uh, so that government officials and uh, budget makers and policy makers can listen to classroom teachers, what we were talking about a little earlier. Another way is uh, by using donors choose as a currency for rewarding educational outcomes. Some of you may know that uh, merit pay or teacher performance pay is sort of like the, the third rail political issue in education reform today. And a few years ago, we had a chance to, to kind of hack the merit pay debate. We were lucky enough to win the Google Impact Award. It came with a $5 million grant, and we used that grant to underwrite donors choose classroom funding credits that we gave to, to teachers who launched and helped their students pass math and science AP courses. So the way this worked was any uh, high school teacher in a low-income community who raised their hand to say, I'm going to start a calculus AB course. I'm going to start a physics AP course. They were given upfront donors choose classroom funding credits. You could think of it as an altruistic signing bonus so that they would be able to fund their own classroom projects and get the graphing calculators they would need to teach calculus AB or build the lab that they would need to start teaching biology AP. And then at the end of the school year, every student who passed their math or science AP exam unlocked $100 of donors choose credits for their teacher. So if you're one of these participating teachers and 20 of your students pass the calculus AB exam, you get a $2,000 donors choose funding credit to spend on your own classroom projects or on your colleagues' classroom projects. Results were compelling enough that um, Google made another grant so we could take this approach with girls learning the code. So about two years ago, any public school teacher in America could unlock $1,000 of donors choose classroom funding credits if and when four or more of their female students demonstrated proficiency in computer science fundamentals using either a module on Code Academy or Khan Academy that required students to actually show proficiency as they progressed through the videos. And what was really exciting to us was that um, teachers and teachers unions responded really positively to this, this kind of new take on performance pay because by switching the currency with which the reward was paid from cash money to classroom funding credits, 
We were speaking to teachers' hearts rather than to their wallets. We were saying, if you do something awesome with your students, you should be able to further transform your classroom as you see fit. You can imagine what the dynamic was like for students who could say, you see that classroom library? I got that for our classroom when I passed the Calculus AB exam. That field trip we went on yesterday, I made that possible when I learned how to code. So we ran a test uh, with Mike where we were, we were hoping to show that uh, offering donors choose classroom funding credits would be even more powerful than cash. Uh, what we found when we um, randomly assigned teachers who use Edmodo to be offered either $500 in cash or $500 in donors choose classroom funding credits or a mere encouragement, we offered them the, the, one of those three things to get their students through a Common Core math module, uh, we found that cash, uh, offering $500 cash, had a serious multiplier effect. Uh, on uh, the likelihood that a teacher would in fact uh, get their students through this, this Khan Academy Common Core math module. Um, and what was really exciting was that uh, we had a pretty big multiplier when offering a classroom funding credit. A multiplier not quite as big uh, as when offering cash, but nevertheless, uh, we had the ability to say uh, to a philanthropist or a foundation, if you want to seriously multiply the number of teachers who go forth and do something that you want them to do, you ought to consider offering them this altruistic uh, uh, currency for rewarding educational outcomes. And this is an approach we could take with any discrete educational outcome, whether it's reducing absenteeism or keeping up a high school newspaper uh, at a certain frequency and quality. Uh, it's really any discrete educational outcome could be incentivized. So in any case, I hope that that uh, gets some of your wheels turning, and I hope at a minimum uh, that you rock out on our data. Thanks for your time. A couple of questions for Charles. Uh, so that last study was uh, super interesting. So it looks like the cash incentive was actually better than the classroom funding. Is that right? It was. Okay. Yeah. And um, do you, I don't know how many teachers were invited uh, to pursue the incentives. Do you know anything about whether it was different sorts of teachers that responded to the two incentives? Uh, we did look at... Um, the different types of teachers, we wondered if there might be a different response based on um, the teacher being a low in, in, working in a low-income community versus an upper-income community. Right. Right. And there, there were some differences based on teacher type, but none of the differences switched. In, in, um, none of the differences changed the fact that cash was somewhat more, it generated somewhat higher uh, outcomes than the classroom funding credit. So you could change the, the degree to which uh, cash outperformed classroom funding credits, but never we were never able to flip it by, for example, strictly looking at teachers in low-income communities. And I also wonder about the staying power. I mean, that would be an expensive study to run, but if you kept this incentive going on for like many months or semesters, would the classroom funding have more staying power, do you think? Th that's what we hope. There were a couple things um, that meant we were actually sort of fighting with one arm tied behind our back in the study. A big one, right, Mike, was that students didn't really know uh, what, was, what was in it for their teacher or for their classroom. Um, the teacher knew, uh, but we potentially could have created a very different dynamic if students knew from the outset, all right, if we get through this Common Core math module, our classroom is going to be $500 better. Uh, and and they, didn't, they certainly didn't know about the incentive um, in the other test flights. So we do think there were a couple things we could do differently if we ever do this study again um, uh, that, that could potentially change the, the dynamic and staying power would be, would be chief among them. Okay, for one more question. Yeah. Um, this is super exciting, and oh, uh, you definitely did succeed, at least for me, in getting me excited about your data. Um, awesome. And the particular area that I think is most interesting is different kinds of accountability mechanisms. Because if I understand correctly what you've done here, you have outcome accountability. And uh, so they are rewarded if they achieve this outcome That's of right. getting them proficient on Khan Academy or whichever other test. Now, there have been these federal and state initiatives with high stakes outcome accountability mm -hmm. that have led to all kinds of corruption mm -hmm. and school administrators going to jail mm -hmm. uh, because of falsification of student test scores. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that this is really ripe for 
different kinds of accountability structures where you can have a rather than just outcome accountability, which we know is fraught with potential for corruption. You can imagine who else might be completing the Khan Academy test online um, for the students, uh, but also maybe introducing procedural accountability, process accountability, also different kinds of professional accountability. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that and if you know if there is any corruption of your system already. Or are you monitoring that? Yeah. Well, so first to, to uh, echo your point, I think you know we, we spoke with the leading teachers union officials, and um, many of them just uh, responded really warmly and enthusiastically to this new take on how you could uh, reward educational outcomes without potentially creating some of the incentives for corruption for high stakes when when the basis for the high stakes is is shifty. But this, the, you know, kids uh, and teachers getting classroom resources based on achieving an outcome felt much more uh, uh, palatable. Um, in terms of whether there's corruption on donors choose, um, I, I would I, I would posit that a whole lot less than when cash is being dangled in front of people. Um, and yet, uh, there are occasional instances where a teacher who is not out for personal material gain, but who wants to uh, improve their classroom. Um, as an example, um, years ago, Microsoft Bing uh, uh, offered to give anyone a $5 donors choose gift code if they switched their uh, s default search engine to Bing. And we did have one teacher out of a few hundred thousand who like wrote a script and who scored like like thirty thousand dollars of donors choose classroom funding credits, but not because they were going to personally enrich. They they wanted to make their classroom a, a brilliant, vibrant place, and it's maybe an unethical uh, approach to an to uh, an ethical ultimate outcome. Long story short, I we we would need to prove it, and we'd love to work with someone to test whether it's true. But I, I would throw out there that there's a, a heck of a lot less. Uh, um, uh, corrupt methods when an altruistic uh, currency is the reward uh, versus when there's a, a cash reward. Though who knows? I don't know. Maybe if it's an altruistic reward, that makes people feel like they could do absolutely anything because uh, it's all for the good of the children. And so, you know, uh, game on. Who, uh, we'd, we'd be happy to participate in, in a study to figure that out. We do have to move on. Thank you so much. Charles. Thank you. <laughs> Hello? Hello. It won't come nope. through the house. It's just for the video. Just for the, OK. Um, oh, you, you, you click? Is that the plan? There we go. Don't videotape that part. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start again. <laughs> okay, great. So I'm going to talk about giving effectively. Um, and I think there's some hope although it's not all roses. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about, there's kind of two parts here. I'm going to talk first about, about a new effort that we, that we have underway that we're incubating at Innovations for Poverty Action called Impact Matters. It is a separate entity that we're going to create and spin off at some point. Um, and basically what Impact Matters is trying to do is address a basic fundamental market failure in the charitable space. So think about the following very simple thought exercise. We are in a business school, so hopefully this resonates. You know, if you're a for-profit, your purpose is to maximize profits, and what determines if you survive its profits, right? That's, this is Econ 101. If you're a nonprofit, what is your purpose? It's to achieve a mission. What determines whether you survive, whether you make profits, not whether you achieve your mission? There's a fundamental disconnect here. Okay, and that disconnect happens if the donors, the stakeholders who are determining whether or not you survive or not, whether you're profitable, give to you based on whether you achieve your mission or whether they give to you for some other reason. Okay, so in econ speak, this is, there's basically poor information on impacts that leads donors to not necessarily know who's good, who's not, who's doing, who's, who's doing effective work, who's achieving their mission. And there's also many behavioral drivers of giving that we're well aware of, some we just heard about. 
some quirky things that drive behavior, right? That's not, that's not choosing, in the example that we just heard, which classroom needs the money the most and is going to do the most good with it. That's choosing based on the affinity of the names. Okay, that's, that's great. I'm actually glad you found that because if it raised more money for, for that, that's, that's, I'm happy about that. But that's not giving based on impact, right? That's giving based on stuff. And there's many, many other things. We could, have count, we could go on and on and on about non-impact things that drive giving behavior. We all realize this. So, but that basically leads to an adverse selection problem, which leads to a misallocation of resources. There's definitely donors out there, we, I call them skeptical altruists, who are skeptical that things actually work. And so their reaction isn't just to be driven by behavioral things, but their reaction is probably to just go and buy a fancy watch or a yacht if they're really rich or another home. Whereas if they actually knew that, no, this program over here right there actually works, they might shift more resources towards charitable giving. And so this leads to a, a basic market failure that is both about an under-provision of the in aggregate of charitable funds raised, but is also about a misallocation of the wrong things getting funded. Okay. So what are we doing at Impact Matters is we're, we're you know, making an attempt to try, to try to tackle this by creating a market for impact. So we're very small right now. We have ambitions to grow. What we are doing is creating an impact audit. An audit is a short-run engagement, about three months. And we basically produce two reports out of this, a public report that goes to the world, you know, the internet, um, the world, for them to see. And, and we're trying to then, you know, as we grow, we will do a lot of work to try to engage consumers to get this out there. So ideas from behavioralists is, is, are quite welcome for figuring out uh, new channels and ways of getting this out. The second is a private report that goes back to the organization. One of the things that I think is missing as a si separate note with a lot of the charity rating systems that are out there is that, well, there's a, a few things missing, but one of them in particular is that the charity doesn't get too much out of it aside from the report that might, may help them raise money, and if it doesn't, then it doesn't. But they don't actually get advice. And so one of the things that we're doing as part of this audit, in the same way that a, an accounting audit is supposed to give organizations actual guidance about how they can improve their internal controls and management systems, then we're taking that same approach. And so when we identify weaknesses in how they're using and producing appropriate evidence of impact, we give them private advice um, on that as part of the audit report. But for the public, there's a general, um, a general report that is helping the world know whether this is an organization that uses and produces appropriate evidence of impact. Um, and, and right now, what we see in the world are Charity Navigator on one end of the spectrum, which just uses financial ratios and is great for weeding out about 1% of organizations that are fraudulent and is um, not good at all for doing anything whatsoever about whether the organization is actually effective beyond identifying fraudulent cases. Um, and the, the, the reality is, I, 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 this is a total conjecture, but I think the type of people that know to look at Charity Navigator to identify fraud has no overlap whatsoever with the kind of people who give to fraudulent organizations, um, unfortunately, because that's a kind of door-to-door -door fundraising telethon kind of world, not a, um, not a world of people who know to go on the internet and look these things up. Okay. One of the mantras that we have, and this distinguishes part of what we're doing, people here might be familiar with GiveWell. Um, which is an organization I'm a big fan of GiveWell. They use a lot of the research from Innovations for Poverty Action, so I kind of have to be a fan of them. Um, um, and, um, but what they are doing is being what's called cause agnostic, which is to say that they are looking at strict cost effectiveness, and they are saying, nope, this cause is simply more cost effective than this cause and that cause, and so we're going to now recommend what we consider to be the single best. And this is great if you want to seed all decision making, including preferences over cause, to someone else to do that analysis. And also just don't have any preferences that you actually like education over health or you have preferences for giving in one area of the world versus another. But I don't think that's, I, I, as an economist, I've, I, I have to admire that. Um, I do admire that. But as a, as a realist, as a behavioralist, I think that is a, a, a more modest approach is to say people are going to choose their cause with their heart. And all we want to do is help them then choose the charity with their mind. Right? And so, and it's not to say there might, if I have the opportunity to sit there face to face with someone, I might not want to say to them, you know, you know, for that one, no offense, school in Indiana, I got to use it because you're right here, um, in Indiana that you can help, you can help a hundred schools and, in Uganda for the same cost. 
right? So which do you prefer to do? Do you want to help 100 or 1? And obviously, if you're dealing with an analytical mind, that, you know, that's kind of hard to make that argue against that trade-off. But I'm well aware of the fact that that's not a winning argument in most cases. And in most cases, I would much prefer to just say, I'm going to accept the fact that you want domestic education, and now let's figure out how to get you into a good choice within the space of domestic education. Um, so what we rate when we do this, we, we look at cost effectiveness. So we, we calculate as best as we can that. It's a messy process, but we do. Very important, we look at the quality of the impact evidence. So if they have a randomized trial, great. But if they don't, we look elsewhere. We see what, el what randomized trials have been done from other places and what non-experimental evidence is there maybe from your own data. And then, you know, what are the biases? And then, and then we make an assessment on the quality of, of that impact evidence, both from that they have, as well as how well what they're doing maps to where there are randomized trials and scientific evidence from elsewhere. The third is we look at the quality of monitoring systems. Um, this is a, not a very academic-y exercise, certainly not as an economist. We're not focused here on the impact, but we're just trying to understand how well do they collect data to uh, be accountable to say, are they doing the things they say they're doing? What's the connection between the field ops and headquarters, and how's that data flow? And that's really important for just being a well-run organization. You can see, you know, seven organizations run the same idea with very different quality implementation, and this is about trying to get a sense of that. And the fourth is, are they a learning and iterating organization? Did they run one randomized trial 27 years ago, and they're still doing the same thing? Um, odds are that's probably not the best then anymore, and people have learned how to do something better. Are they iterating? Are they learning? Um, so, you know, can this actually lead to higher donations? So I'm on to part two of the talk. How am I doing on time? Awesome. So part two of the talk is brief. Is here's one experiment we did that gives me hope. It gives me a little bit of hope that there's that you can move some people towards effective giving. So I did a randomized trial with Freedom from Hunger on their business training program. It was actually I started this actually when I was in graduate school back in 2001. Um, we published it. It looked fairly good for them. Um, and generating some positive impacts. We then ran a randomized trial. They basically did this as a favor for me. No one really thought this was going to work. Um, and we, um, so we ran a randomized trial with their current donors to say, um, and we had a control that was an emotional appeal, a very standard emotional appeal. This is doing business training for entrepreneurs in Latin America. And it had a story about Maria and her pig farm. And is that a term, pig farm? But whatever, she's raising pigs and getting some business training. And so it, it told the story. Right? And the treatment told the same story, but shortened it a little, just took out a couple paragraphs, and then inserted, and we did a randomized trial, blah, 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 and we had a little sentence about selection bias, although not using jargon, um, and saying, you know, we had a positive impact on boom, 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 these things. Okay, so what did we find? We found on average, if we had a little more time, I would do a little poll and we could do a little clicker, but I'll tell you the punchline, we found no difference whatsoever on average. But here's the kind of neat thing. It was very heterogeneous. So what we find is for the people who had previously given a lot, they actually responded positively and they liked the appeal. For people who gave very little in the past, they actually went down and they gave less. So it wasn't just a null effect, it was less. Right? The average effect is null. So if you just looked at it simply, which is actually the way a lot of charitable fundraising in the, in the real world gets done, very little heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous, heterogeneous treatment effects get examined. Um, and there's, I think, a lot to be learned from doing that because people are not the same. Um, and here we find the small versus large. What do we think is happening there? Um, so here's one idea, and it's, you know, it's, this is crude, their ability to map those results to, to theory, but there's, here's one theory that this maps to, which is to say people who are small donors are like, more likely warm glow givers. These are individuals who join, who, who, who send money to participate in a, in a charity and they feel good participating in that charity. And you don't really get too much extra return when, you, when you're a warm glow giver. You actually prefer to give to lots of little charities rather than like say, well, what's the most effective and I'll just send all my money there. Um, so if you're giving to lots of little charities and you're warm glow, um, why, do you, why do you not respond rather than respond negatively? Well, it could be that just putting forward the idea of scientific evidence makes you, it, it does one of two things. It turns off the emotional triggers which make you give, or it actually makes you realize, holy crap, I never thought about it. Yeah, the, some of this stuff might not work. Um, and even though this thing just said it did work, what it does is it puts in your mind that uncertainty um, and makes you wonder. 
Whereas the, 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 the people who are previously giving a lot, they might be thinking harder about, about their gift, being a bit more analytical about the gift, and likewise um, responding positively. Okay, so two areas we want to take this. So there's two areas for potential collaboration. I don't you know, know exactly who all of this room, but let me, um, my understanding is that's a lot of the purpose of this, of this gathering. It's mainly people from Charity Navigator. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Um, the, the first is we want to conduct impact audits to build, um, to build more ratings. This means we need nonprofits to participate um, and we need donors to fund them. That's our basic model for doing, um, doing these is to have, we will have some core support, but then we commission the audits from donors who say, hey, I really like this charity and my way of, I want to either supplement my gift to them by paying for an impact audit or, or use it as a screening device. Um, the second is we want to do more research on effective communication. So for nonprofit partners, it's how to get donors to respond about evidence of impact, who to target with which appeal, so how to, how to understand that heterogeneity within one's own data. Um, one key question that I think is critical on this is does aid effectiveness spill over to others? So if you promote yours as being effective, this might be great for getting you more money. I want to know whether that comes from some other nonprofit or whether you're buying a less fancy watch or no watch at all. Um, I think that's a very important question for us to understand from a societal perspective. You might promote effectiveness and it just shifts. Um, it makes you realize not only is this working, but that means something else might not be. That's a, it's just an important fact for us to know. Um, on the corporate employee fundraising side, there's a lot of employee giving that does create, um, there's believed to create stronger corporate communities. How to encourage within that construct effective giving could be very, um, very um, exciting, I think. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. We have time for one amazing question. Okay. Right. Uh, so I, I'm going to make it a two part, but hopefully quick. Uh, so I have a couple of results in mind for my own work that I think might nicely relate, and I'd love your, love your take on it. So the first one is when people are deciding how to give, not whether to give, they're just allocating money, you do see that they have a dislike of inefficiency. Um, but when they're deciding whether or not to give, to keep money for myself or not, that dislike now appears much stronger. So there appears to be this potential overweighting of, of this inefficiency, speaking perhaps to the fact that people don't care so much about inefficiency, uh, they might just like to use it as an excuse not to give. Um, the second one is that when we're trying to think of this heterogeneity and how to explain types, is perhaps thinking about well, who's gonna be more likely to be susceptible uh, to these uh, excuses or wiggling out of giving, and one way you can sometimes gain traction on that, which relates really nicely to your study, is individuals who have already given in the past, um, they're kind of committed to giving, they're unlikely to be excuse driven, or individuals who are giving larger amounts versus new donors might be more susceptible to being on that, on that margin. Um, just as a... Uh, the first does seem interesting, and it strikes me like, uh, I don't know, my, first, my reaction hearing it is that um, you know, when someone's thinking about whether to give or not, any excuse just pulls them out. Um, you know, any excuse that seems reasonable. Whereas in the other, you have, I don't know exactly how you did it, but you have many dimensions over which you're choosing and there's trade-offs. Um, and so that's one, and there's also cause you care about, and you might call, care about geography, and so there's other, other things, and it's just one of those things to, to care about. I mean, I don't know how you presented efficiency, but one of the, you know, one of the issues that that I think we all, f that we face in this space is that when the minute you report, if you reported efficiency as overheads, then, um, well then that's a problem because that's not efficiency. Um, but yet people interpret it as efficiency. So if it's instead reported as, you know, for $10 you can generate um, $25 of social good, um, then that's efficiency. Um, and so there might be people not understanding efficiency too. Yeah. So. Yeah. The perfect yeah. transition okay. <laughs> overhead to Liz Keenan. Thanks so much, Dean. Good morning. So yes, that was a perfect lead-in to um, overhead aversion. So today I'd like to share with you a little bit about some of my explorations in motivating donors to give. Uh, the first is a project in which um, we worked with a large uh, education foundation to uh, basically get around the problem of individual donors' aversion to overhead. So imagine you had the opportunity or you were actually considering giving to one of two hunger charities. Uh, Charity A reports um, some, some 
you know, outcomes that they've had, but they also describe very clearly on their website uh, how their, their funding is allocated. So when they receive a donation, you find out that 95% of what you give is going directly toward the food programs, maybe purchasing food and things of that sort, uh, whereas 5% is being used to cover what we would call overhead, which are the administrative and fundraising costs associated with running that charity. Versus Charity B gives similar information about what they've been doing, but then instead their breakdown of alloc their allocation of donations is 50% goes toward the impact or the cost specific programming, whereas 50% then is used on supporting the charity's operations. Which one would you want to give your money to? So if you're like most donors, you might choose Charity A, right? In the face of poor information about impact, as Dean was talking about, donors tend to lean on this type of information to make their donation decisions. And then also, as discussed earlier, this is not necessarily reflective of the efficiency of the organization. And so it could be guiding dollars and directions that may not make the most sense um, if we really do want to care about the impact in the end. Um, so we ran a couple of uh, different studies, one of uh, which uh, was done in the lab. And we wanted to know, sort of, is it really just about the percentage of overhead uh, that people are turned off by? Or is it the idea that their money is being used on it, specifically my donation? And so we ran this uh, study in which we um, presented information about a, a charity. The overhead information was the same across all the different conditions, but in one case, their donation was going to be allocated in the way um, that the, the, the allocations were typically described, whereas in another case, it was told that a generous donor has um, covered the overhead for you. So you know what the overhead is. It's 50%, but you won't have to pay for that. People were just as likely to give in that condition as if there was no overhead at all. Right? So it's this thought that, well, it's not maybe as much about the number itself, but it's the idea that my dollars are being used on that overhead. And so we wanted to take advantage of that in the field and think, well, if we cover the overhead for them, maybe we can get more people to give. And so what we did is we worked with this foundation I mentioned earlier, it was a large education foundation, and we had um, access to 40,000 potential donors who had given to similar charities in the past. Uh, and they received one of four different letters. All of this was real, so uh, the, um, the generous donation given was used in the way it described. So we had one condition in which individuals just read a standard solicitation where they were told about the charity, what it does, and asked to give money. Uh, in a second letter, they might have read that a generous donor has already given $10,000 toward this cause, so you could see that there's some seed funding already invested in this cause. In a third condition, you might have gotten a letter about a match. So the organization has received $10,000, and we will match uh, your dollars, your donations, uh, with this gift up to $10,000 total. And then in the last condition, we wanted to take advantage of this overhead aversion and say, well, instead of just announcing it as seed funding, let's just frame it a little bit and say, we've received $10,000. It's going to be used to cover all overhead costs associated with your donation. What's this going to do to giving? So what you see here is total raised in the different conditions. We have the, the uh, letter types on the bottom. So control raised about $8,000. Seed and matching raised $13,000 and $12,000 respectively, which was significantly greater than what we had seen in the control group. But if it was described as overhead free, that the $10,000 was being put toward overhead, individuals gave uh, a little over $23,000. Now, you might wonder, was it that average giving increased? Did people give more money? Um, or was it the number of individuals? It turns out it was the number of individuals giving. So the average donation in the seed funding match and overhead free groups was the same. Um, they were a little higher than the control. But it was that more people gave in these groups. Um, and so this actually had this, I mean, this effect size is, is big and it's important. Um, and a lot of charities uh, either loved it or hated it. Um, the ones that loved it were ones that have access to large initial gifts that they might be able to uh, capitalize and leverage to be able to get more donations into the organization. Many organizations, one in fact, uh, Charity Water uses a very similar model. So they have something called the well, where large generous donors give to the well, and the well is used to help cover the overhead associated with Charity Water. And then as a giver, if you're just an individual giver, you can get 100% um, of your donation directly toward the causes that they're helping to serve. Um, and so that works for an organization like that. But then there's others who say, you know, we've worked so hard to convince and communicate with our donors the importance of overhead. 
that we need this to survive, that this is an important thing to support, that it can be just as impactful to give to that as you would uh, give toward um, you know, the food purchased for the hungry child. Um, and so we realize it's not necessarily a sustainable uh, implementation or sustainable uh, intervention to use. And so what we've been trying to do is try to figure out ways to really deal with overhead a little bit more directly and actually focus a bit more on, on impact um, and allowing donors to have impact. Um, so we've done a number of things, some with less or more success than others, um, but one I wanted to share, so something that we're currently working on, um, is giving donors choice. So since there were donors in that group who actually opted into giving all of a sudden when there was an overhead free option, we thought, well, let's let them choose. Maybe there are those who would never give if they knew their money was going to overhead. Maybe there's, those, there are those that would get, not give because they don't like the proportion. Uh, and they want to move that around a little bit. Um, this was inspired a little bit, actually, um, by Charles, Charles's work. If you go on to um, donorschoose.org and you select a, a project, you choose to give $100 to it, at checkout, you see a little note at the bottom that says, this $100 donation includes an optional donation. If you click on that, you then get to this page that describes what this optional donation helps to cover. And then you can actually change the amount if you'd like. And so what we're doing is we're playing around with this idea of giving choice, um, the idea being that it might capture those who wouldn't have given at all. Uh, and then just more globally, it may also, um, there's been some evidence that allowing agency in choice and giving people control has some positive outcomes. So we could see maybe some positive trickle down effects of giving this choice. The other uh, is that it may, with Christine's work, help to reduce this um, opportunity for having an excuse not to give. Um, and so that is what we're currently working on. We do see some positive evidence that suggests that people like uh, the idea of choice. They would be more likely to give, and they actually report feeling more impactful uh, if they have that choice. All right, finally, sort of future idea. Um, this, uh, also I've collected some data on already, but it's, I'm putting this out here because it would be really fun to uh, test this with a charity in the wild. Um, and so the idea is um, to allow the donors themselves to match in a different way. So you can think of it a couple ways. This is one um, instantiation of, of the thought that you know, would you like to match a recent donation today? So there is evidence that showing what, don what donors have already been given helps, especially if the amounts are relatively small. You see others have given and you think, oh, that's reasonable, I, I can do that too. Um, so there's some social proof of giving, um, but then also there's a bit of a challenge involved. So rather than just listing dollar handles, maybe you uh, design it in such a way that sort of describes what's been recently given and you give them the opportunity to match recent donations. Um, and this also gets around the idea uh, that for matching, you need a large gift initially. You don't, right? You can, you can kind of capitalize on what you've already been, been receiving. Uh, the other uh, way of thinking about it is maybe to challenge them to challenge another person to be the match. So if you give money today, we're going to use your $25 and challenge somebody else to also match uh, your $25 and sort of build on this, um, whole, hopefully, sort of a snowball effect of giving. Uh, anyway, so I'd love to talk to anybody about these ideas uh, during any of the breaks and to take any questions that you have now. Let's clap first. <laughs> or that. I actually stuck to my six slides. That was so. pretty good. Just <laughs> Question for Liz? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you noticed any differences among generations in terms of the giving behavior with this particular treatment. With the overhead free. Yes. Okay. So with the overhead free Yeah. Are there any differences in genera generational differences in that uh, the effectiveness of the overhead free? Um, so in the lab, no because it was all undergrads. Uh, in the field we actually don't have access to the information about the individual donors um, short of what they give gave or in the fact that they had given to a similar cause in recent recent past. Um, but I do, I, so I ran uh, three replications of the overhead free with three new charities in the fall, and I actually have those data. So I haven't been able to dig into the um, ages yet, um, but I'll, I'll take a look. I don't, I don't have an answer for you. Mm -hmm. I'd love to talk more about it. That'd be great. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if the um, work on, where you give people agency of choosing what kind of um, overhead you would like to give, and in your example there, 
Is it that um, everyone feels more impactful, or is it only the ones that confirm that they don't want to give overhead anyway? Or are the people who say, well, I'm willing to cover 15%, just as likely to say, I've done some, something really good today? That's, that's a good question. I don't have uh, data yet that would necessarily tell me that answer. Right now, it's all been hypothetical, um, and sort of just like, how likely do you think people would be to give, and how impactful would you feel? Um, but if I break it out based on those who... Um, if I get, then give them the choice, right? If they select into doing it or not, and then take a look at um, at the impact, that that would help answer that question. Great, out of time. Thank you so much. Can I use this guy? The yeah. okay, awesome. So um, as you, I should have said at the beginning again, in case you weren't here in the morning, but my goal with the um, present something you already have done, present something you're working on, present an idea, is to start collaborations. So if you hear things that are interesting, uh, either actually with academics or organizations here, please reach out to folks because we always want to test um, our crazy ideas uh, in the field. I love that. I already told Liz, but I love that be a match thing because it's totally going to work, uh, which is cool. Okay. so. Um, my favorite finding, I wanted to start with this because it informs the other stuff uh, that we, we've done, is a, a paper that's old now with um, Liz Dunn and Lara Acknon, where the initial idea, Liz's initial idea was, um, does it actually make people happy to give? And so um, Lara, who was a grad student at the time, she's now a professor at Simon Fraser, that's how long it's been, uh, went out on uh, campus at UBC and gave people um, envelopes filled with cash, which was awesome to begin with uh, because we had never done that before. And some people had a slip of paper that said, by 5 p.m. today, spend this money on a bill and expense or a gift for yourself. And other people had a slip of paper that said, by 5 p.m. today, spend this money on a charitable donation or a gift for somebody else. And the only other thing we did was we put different amounts of cash in that. So some people got five bucks and some people got uh, 20 bucks. That's Canadian money. <laughs> That's real money. Is anyone here from Canada? I don't have a joke. I just was <laughs> Sometimes I make fun of Canada right now, but I won't. So. Um, <laughs> Americans are like, that looks like Monopoly money, and I don't know who that lady is. <laughs> so um, we've got four groups of people, uh, five for yourself, 20 for yourself, five for somebody else, 20 for somebody else. Uh, call them up that night, what'd you do with the money, and uh, how happy are you uh, with, with your day? Lots of predictions you can make. One, one easy one is like $20 people happier than five, because 20 is more than five. You could say that personal people, because I mean, free money for yourself, amazing, having to give to somebody else, not so good. We thought, of course, we'd see the opposite, which is that um, uh, you'd be happier if you gave. I'll just show you quickly what the stuff people bought. Liz calls it tchotchke uh, in the personal condition. So people bought junk for themselves, basically, stuff they didn't really need. People in the pro-social condition bought cooler stuff, like a stuffed animal for their niece, I think. People gave money to homeless people, money to charity. We're good scientists, so you might think maybe it's just that stuffed animals are cooler than earrings, and that's why those people are happier. Amazing thing happened, though, is that um, give a college undergraduate $5 at 9 a.m. and they just crazily go to Starbucks. <laughs> but what's cool is some people go to Starbucks and buy coffee for themselves. Some people go and give it to somebody else. Again, you could think coffee for yourself, awesome. Watching someone drink your coffee, not awesome. But we find at the end of the day that people are happier when they give. And the amount of money doesn't seem to matter that much. We didn't do like you get a million dollars for yourself. I'm sure that would be awesome. <laughs> so it's not that money never matters, obviously. But at least in this range, it seems like giving makes you happier than spending on yourself. And the reason that I started um, with that is because it actually informs, the ethos of that informs everything we do, which is when we design interventions to encourage people to give to charity, we're trying to design ones that are fun and happy. Like, so of course we know uh, cool research about, um, including some by Deb, about like facial expressions and things, and the intuition is you show sad kids and you feel really badly and then you give, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that model, but it's not awesome for donors because you mainly feel bad and really you didn't do anything by giving anyway. So we tried to design interventions that are cool. Like people are like, oh my god, that's really fun. I want to give. And hopefully along the way, they've actually become more altruistic. So the ongoing research is a project with uh, Grant Donnelly and Duncan, who's at MIT. Grant is standing in the back. This was a project with a local retailer who were um, giving people, they give a lot of money to charity. Uh, and they, Waltham is a town around here. They, they're like a membership club. And so it's one of those places where you buy like 800 pounds of spaghetti kind of places. So think of that. And they were doing, giving lots of money to charity. And they were giving people, when they came in, this slip of paper that said, hey, we're giving a lot of money to charity. Here's the ones we're giving to this month. 
And they were hoping that people would be like, my, that's really nice. I should buy more stuff to say thanks for doing that. And um, nothing happened. And why? Think about if you went into a store and got a slip of paper like that. You would probably look at it, read it for a sec, and then like bottom of the cart or trash or like why would you hang on to it? As, as compared to a very, very simple intervention that we did, which you probably already guessed, which is we just when you come in the store, we say, which of these do you want to vote for? And the one with the most go votes gets the most money. Importantly, it's not that the other ones get none, because that made people upset. It's that it gets the most. So everyone still wins, but you get to pick who um, gets the most. And what we see in this very simple intervention is that people buy more stuff in the store when they get to vote. I think it's like $10, 8 or $10 or something like that. So it's not like they double the, and these are huge basket sizes, so it's not like they buy everything in the store. But it's 8 or $10 for the cost of a piece of paper and like golf pencils. That's all it costs for the retailer but it has an impact on their behavior. And to Dean's point actually about heterogeneity, uh, it turns out that you could think, so who does it work best for? New customers or loyal customers? You could imagine either, right? Like new customers don't know the store that well, all of a sudden this happens, now they really love it. Whereas loyal customers already like the place so it doesn't matter. It turns out it works especially well for loyal customers. So the people actually that they really would love because they get membership renewals and things, that who it, that's who it works really well for. That's my ongoing one, how am I doing? Oh, great. Um, oh, the other cool thing about this actually is that um, we looked at what they bought in the store. And it turns out, if I'm, hopefully I'm right about this, they buy more store brand products. Yeah, so it's like uh, if you're deciding between local store brand or like Bounty or whatever, you're a little bit more likely to say, oh, I kind of like this store, maybe I'll buy a little bit more uh, of what, what they do, which also helps them on the back end. OK, now for the um, ongoing, uh, it's a little ongoing in the lab, but we want field data for sure. This is a project with our uh, now recently former student, Kate Baraz, who's going to ESA, and my colleague, Leslie John, here at Harvard Business School. This is an idea of Kate's that um, was another one where she came in and said it, and we were like, oh my god, that's totally going to work. So it was exciting. And her idea was, um, she called it pseudo set framing. And the idea is that um, people love to um, complete stuff for whatever reason. Like when new quarters come out or something from the US Mint, people are like, I, I got to get them all. I need all the quarters. I don't know why, but people are like plates with like birds. They're like, I need all the bird plates. <laughs> and until they get the last plate, they're like, it's worthless. Like I need everything in the set in order to be a happy human being. At least it's a very maladaptive behavior, obviously. But she had this idea that maybe people <laughs> like to complete things even that have no meaning. So at least there's 50 states. So like you need 50 quarters to have 50 states. But Kate's idea is that you could just make up any set you wanted. And people would be like, oh, I should totally finish that. And the idea that she had was just to show people pie charts <coughs> that fill up. And that if you had a pie chart that was kind of halfway filled, you'd be like, ugh, I better fill it. So the first experiment that she did, which was amazing, was she had um, screens with dots, like hundreds of dots <laughs> on them. And you were supposed to count the number of dots and enter the correct answer. And the cool thing was um, you didn't get paid. So you could just not do any of the dot tasks. <coughs> So in a control version, she's just like, count some dots. And people are like, nope, <laughs> count any dots. They do one, and then they're like, wait, what the heck? I'm not going to count any more dots. But she did one where she showed them, thanks. She did one where she showed them a pie chart. And when they did one, they saw a pie chart with one part, four-piece pie chart, and one was filled in. And then people did four. Crazily, like 30%, like 2%, I'm making it up slightly, but it's like 2 to 5% in the nothing and like 30% in the pie chart one do four. And only four. Like it's not now they like dots, they're like done, nice. And then she was gonna do it where she popped another one up but that was mean. So just this idea that, that making something up for no reason we'd be like, ah, that feels good. And you can feel it in your mind actually. It's like, mm, nice, done with the pie chart. So the original idea that she had was based on this. You know when you're at um, the supermarket and they're like, would you like to give a dollar today to this charity and they kind of vaguely explain it? And you're like, ah, I already gave a dollar last week. Like, I don't want to give an another dollar because I already did this. Her idea was, what if the display actually said, you'd given once before, and the display said that. And now you're like, oh, well, I've only given once. And obviously, I should give four, four times. <laughs> but it doesn't make any sense why it would be four. <laughs> and the cool thing is, like, it's a pie chart, right? So you could be like that or that or that. <laughs> and people will keep trying to fill it up. So the, um, maybe that's too extreme. So the um, experiment that we did was sort of a quasi-field experiment, but we'd love to do with a, a real organization, 
is um, Kate found this organization where you can send, you can write cards to lonely elderly people, like in nursing homes and um, other facilities, and they really get the cards, and it's an amazing, awesome thing to do. And she thought, um, let's use that as our dependent measure. Let's have people write cards and really deliver them. And the very simple thing um, that we did was, in the control condition, we just said, we're trying to get a lot of cards, and we're going to send them. And we said, um, after they write one card, we say, hey, thanks, you've completed a card. Would you like to write another? People are like, no. Nope. No, I'm done. I already did a good thing for the old people. Like, I'm good forever with old people. <laughs> or within each package, we are batching the cards in sets of four. No explanation for why, just that. And it said, thanks, you've completed 25% of one batch of cards. Would you like to write another? And now way more people write four cards and only four cards again. So again, it's not that they like old people. They like filling up a set, but by encouraging them to do that, we can actually make them um, more likely to complete uh, all of these tasks. So that's something where um, you can think about it in so many contexts where you just show a, a pie chart. And by the way, it's better than a progress bar. You know how progress bars fill up? That's not as cool. There's something about the pie chart filling in. People really like it's like done and finished, and now it looks awesome. So um, we have some field data from um, Global Giving, which is a nonprofit we work with a bit. They did this amazing thing, but before we even chatted with them, um, Kevin Conroy, who's an amazing guy, had this idea that, um, thank you, that um, you can give to many continents with global giving. It's like, uh, you know, there's an entrepreneur in, in uh, some uh, country in South America that you can give to, and they were trying to get people to give more, and they made up a set. They said, um, did you know that you've given to four out of the six continents? Which is like, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> And then they recommended projects from a continent you hadn't given to. And people are way more likely to give to the continent that they haven't given to. Because now continents are technically a real set of things in the world, I understand. But they're certainly not usually relevant for donors as like, man, I'm really low on Africa. Like I need to. But when you present it as a set of things, then you can imagine people are like, well, I've already given to North America. I should totally now give to another uh, continent to make sure that I've done that. So that's something that we'd love to do um, with an organization as well. And with that, I think I am done. Thank you. Uh, one, one question. Yes. Um, what do you think is like the limit of the size of a student set? Like, do people just kind of keep exerting effort indefinitely? Um, what do you think? Yeah, hey, I'm just I mean, curious, actually. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you have to think it caps out. Um, but I actually bet it's much longer than we think. I bet it's many more than four. Yeah. I, I, so we don't know. Like the one that I put up with has like 32. I'm sure people are like, screw that. And in, and in fact, if you think about it, it might be when it's so many, it might be demotivating because you think I could never finish, fill all of it. So, so we haven't played that much with that. But one thing that Kate did do, which was great, is so you can have a pie. Remember the dot thing? You can have a pie chart where one trial fills up one pie piece. But you could also do like you need to do five of those to fill up one pie piece. <laughs> so you can vary the amount needed to fill up a pie piece or the number of pie pieces. And you can do it with donations as well. So like imagine you want to give, you're giving $10 to charity and you're, you decided that. But now I say, well, $10 is only one pie wedge and there's four more to give 50. But if you were going to give 20, I could be like, well, 20 is only, pie wedge, only <laughs> one pie wedge. You have to give four more to give 100. So it's really weirdly flexible, like what each behavior means. But we haven't played a ton with that yet, and I think it would be uh, interesting. Uh, for interest of time, I will stop. And next up is Deb Small. The topic of my presentation is distorted altruism, which is something I've been working on for a very long time. Um, so by distorted altruism, I mean uh, charitable giving or altruistic behavior that fails to, to maximize social utility or, or do as much good as it, as it possibly can. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about, I think, dovetails with, with the discussion that, that we had with Dean earlier today, as well as Liz to some extent. OK, so how should one decide where to give? To, to charity. How should you make this deci decision? What's the right approach to, to thinking about this? Um, there's some two very different perspectives that I'll talk about. Um, so the first is, is based in utilitarian philosophy. 
Um, and it's been endorsed by the philosopher Peter Singer, who's kind of started this whole movement known as effective altruism. And so this, this quote kind of sums it up. It says, there's an enormous amount of suffering everywhere in the world. The question is, how can you do the most good with your charitable dollars? OK, so that's the utilitarian view. Um, we should figure out, as, as Dean is trying to do, how, how your dollars can have the greatest impact and allocate <coughs> scarce resources to that so we can save more lives, do more good in the world. Um, but there's another view that I think resonates with people, as Dean discussed. And so this quote is, this person has to be close to the cause that the charity is promoting in his or her heart. The first question that one should ask is, what turns me on? What do I really care about? OK, and you can see how these two philosophies can lead to very different uh, patterns of behavior. Um, so, so what? So the, the the old research that I'm going to talk about today, the sort of vintage study from my dissertation, um, looks at different forms of information and how this this information influences uh, influences giving. And um, what we did is we had this was kind of before internet studies and 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 um, lots of. Uh, things that have enabled more field experiments, but this is kind of a field experiment. So um, we approached uh, individuals outside at a public, public spaces, and we gave them an opportunity to fill out an unrelated survey in exchange for uh, $5. And then when we paid them, we paid them in $1 bills, and we gave them a letter, and the letter was from the organization Save the Children. We partnered with Save the Children. And this letter always told them that any money that they donated would go towards relieving the severe food crisis in southern Africa and Ethiopia. So here, the, the cause is held constant. Everybody's giving to the same, uh, to the same organization. The money's going to the same place. Um, but we varied the presentation of information on that letter. Uh, so in one condition, we merely presented a bunch of statistics about hunger and poverty. Um, all true information, all information that Save the Children uses on their, on their uh, promotion materials, um, that's what we showed them. In another condition, we showed them this little girl. Um, her name is Rokia. She's also on Save the Children's website. Um, and this is all that we told them. We said, meet Rokia, a seven-year-old girl from Mali, Africa. Now, we had a third condition, which showed both of these. So we presented both statistics and Rokia, what we call the identifiable victim. OK, so uh, you've completed your, imagine you, you're in the study, you've completed your survey, you've gotten your money, and you're asked to donate that money to this organization. And you're either seeing just statistics, just Rokia, or a combination of both. And here's the, the key evidence. So what we find is the middle bar is the identifiable victim. So that's just Rokia. That is far and away the most effective pitch. Um, so it does better than statistics. And, and I think somewhat surprisingly, it does better than providing both the statistical information and the identifiable victim. And we, we argue and have other evidence from other studies I'm not presenting here. That's because the, the statistical information kind of dampens the effectiveness of the emotional appeal. It, it just takes away from that, uh, that gut impulse uh, to help that little girl. Okay, And so here, this is a study in which the, the cause is controlled for. But you can see, imagine that how this, how the, kind of the distorting effect this, this has on charitable giving. Right? So people are drawn to help specific identifiable individuals, whether it's the latest uh, kidnap victim that's flashed all over the media, or um, you know, whoever, pick your favorite uh, identifiable victim. Um, the one I often talk about is, is Jessica McClure, who in the, the 1980s uh, fell into a well near her home in Texas. Some of you will remember that story. Um, those sorts of stories or particular cases drive this inc incredible com compassion that leads to a lot of giving. Um, that, that's, that's nice, but the downside of that, of course, or the, other, the flip side of that coin is that these more statistical victims, the sort of the hidden victims, the mass suffering, is, is relatively ignored and, and just, just doesn't reach people in the same way. OK, so that's the, that's the past research. Um, what about a, a different form of information, actual effectiveness information? So Dean also talked about this as well. Um, so we've been looking now to see whether if you present people with effectiveness information, do they use it when choosing which charities to support? And um, what we've done, this is all hypothetical, by the way, and I'll talk more about that in a second, is we've presented people with sets of charities to choose between in one condition, or in another condition, we presented participants with a set of investments to choose between. And we've actually set this up 
so that they're pretty similar. The only difference is whether you're, decide, you're, you're uh, donating money to a charity or you're investing money in, um, in the same amount of money for something for yourself. Um, but we've tried to match them as much as we can. In this case, these are both housing, clothing, and, uh, and, far, and something kind of medical or pharmaceutical related. Um, but note, these are in different categories. So they are choosing, uh, uh, choosing between different categories to either support or to invest in. And for both of them, we tell them that an uh, independent organization has rated each of these choice options in terms of how effective we are. And we've, um, it's a longer story, but we've uh, tried in we, we've used different language across different studies to, to explain this, and we, 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 we feel pretty confident that people understand what we mean by that. And so we describe it in terms of, in, in the investment condition, how much money they'll, they'll raise through this investment, and in the charity condition, um, how much good will be done per dollar donated. Okay? And then we, random, we randomize these ratings. You can see them, they're embedded in here. So it's not always that housing is the highest rated. That's just in this example. It's, it's actually randomized. Um, and the ratings are the same across the conditions. So everything's the same. The only thing that's different is whether you're choosing a charity or an investment. And what we find is that in the investment condition, it's actually, we're actually kind of surprised that this is low, as low as it is, because you think that everybody would want to maximize when they were investing their money. Um, but that's pro that might be due to the fact that this is hypothetical, so maybe there's just a lot of people who aren't paying that, that close attention. Um, but nonetheless, the large majority of people still are choosing the most effective option in the investment condition, but that goes way down in the charity condition. Um, it's still better than chance. So this is, remember, these are choice sets of three. So 33% would be choosing based on chance. Um, so some people appear to be using this, this information. Um, but it doesn't seem like people are treating this decision of which charity to support in the same way as they're, choosing, or as they're treating the decision of which investment to choose. This is clearly about maximization. Um, this is, is not, not so much, right? And we have lots of other process evidence that examines this more closely. And it seems like people think of the choice of which charity to support more as like consumption, as a personal choice, right? Like, which restaurant do you want to eat at tonight? Which cause do you care about, right? Um, so it's quite different. Um, for my, for my, my, new, my new idea is actually the same idea, but I want to test it in a better way. And I hope that um, some of you might be able to help me. In fact, I might lean on Dean and his new, um, his, his, his new organization. Um, so the question is, can we do this in the field? And we haven't done that yet. We've done hypothetical choice um, so that we can examine the psychological factors and control for a bunch of things and manipulate a bunch of things. Um, but we don't know how that will all play out when people are making real consequential decisions uh, in the field. And so what do we need for that? Uh, we need a context where people can choose among a set of charities. Um, we, needed validate, we need validated effectiveness n numbers to give them. Uh, we, won't, we obviously wouldn't be able to randomize them like we've done in the lab, but we'd like to have some true numbers to give to people that, um, that are meaningful, and the ability to experimentally manipulate the presence <coughs> and display of this effectiveness information to try to understand, first, um, will people use it? And if not, are there, maybe there are better ways to display it or to provide that information in a way that's, um, that's more compelling to people. That's all I have. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it's a question for you and Liz. Do you think that have you considered the fact that the identifiable victim effects can be partly due to the fact that I know where my money is going, so I know there's no overhead at all? Uh, so absolutely that you have a tangible recipient of your money. Um, whether people are spontaneously thinking about overhead, I doubt. But if you ask, perhaps if you ask them about their expectation of overhead, it, that's actually an interesting idea. It might be that people assume lower overhead when, uh, when you present an identifiable victim. That might be rationalization for helping. I don't know if that, it's hard to know what's, what's the order of causality there. but I. I, I think I agree with your intuition. Yeah, Gretchen. If I want to motivate myself to contribute to a charity in the long term, like there's nothing in it for me personally except the warm glow, so I have to pick what's close to my heart. So if housing yeah. is what's close to my heart, I don't care that it has a low effectiveness rating. The warm glow, the passion that I have for housing is what's going to con 
motivate right. me to contribute to that year after year. So the heck with the effectiveness rating, I'm going to go for housing. But if I want to motivate myself to contribute to an investment year after year, my motivation is to make a profit. I'm, I want to see my investment grow. So of right. course the effectiveness rating is key there. So my motives are just really different in the two cases. That's, that's completely consistent with, with what we find. So our, our findings are completely consistent with a warm glow view of charitable giving, not consistent with a social utility maximizing. That, that what's different, I think, is that different from previous research, um, not theoretically, but di different previous research is people haven't looked yet across what, you know, providing effectiveness information and mixing up the nature of the causes and, and to, yeah, to demonstrate that. What I'm trying to make is we actually are getting social utility maximization in a way because it's just it isn't realistic to think that people will contribute over and over again in the, in the long term to right. the thing with the, with the highest effectiveness rating because their heart won't be in it. Like, right. I'd rather have them give every year for 20 years to the thing that's a little bit less effective than to give once to the thing that's very effective. Right, and so that's, that's an empirical, I agree with you, it's an empirical question as one we want to test whether, well, so all of our studies so far have people choosing, it's a forced choice among a set of charities. But another very important question, I think, is likelihood of donating with the presence of effectiveness information. So if I really care about breast cancer, that's what everybody cares a lot about breast cancer. The charities do very well. Um, so we're all, we've all been touched by it. Um, but I see that that, or, that breast cancer organization has a low effectiveness score relative to some others. That might, I think, I think as, as you're suggesting, that might actually dampen my likelihood of giving it all. And so that has a negative effect from a from a welfare perspective. Right. And so we don't, that's it's one of the things we want to test is whether merely providing effectiveness ratings uh, decreases the likelihood of, of donating at all um, if people are turned off by the, if people, you know, now can't justify giving to their favorite organization. Everyone. Um, so we were asked to start with our favorite research findings, so here goes. Um, as Mike already described, there's a great deal of research suggesting that spending money on others can improve happiness. And our lab recently took these findings under the skin to examine whether spending money on others might also improve physical health. In order to test this question, we randomly assigned a group of older adults over the age of 65 who were previously diagnosed with high blood pressure to spend in one of two ways. We gave our participants $120 to spend on themselves or $120 to spend on others for three consecutive weeks. And we measured their blood pressure before, during, and after they spent the study payments. Now, consistent with what Mike was saying earlier, everyone enjoyed receiving money in both conditions. That was true. Um, but for people who are randomly assigned to spend money on themselves, they showed no significant reductions in blood pressure over the course of the study. However, for individuals who are randomly assigned to spend money on others, they showed significant reductions in blood pressure over the course of the study. And these reductions were similar in magnitude to starting a new aerobic exercise program. So these findings may be my favorite because of effort justification. It took nearly six years to complete this project. Um, but these findings also provide some of the first causal evidence that spending money on others might have significant, lead to significant improvements in physical health. So in addition to examining the benefits of financial generosity, I've also become interested in examining factors that predict giving, particularly among those that have the greatest capacity to give. This ongoing program of research came out of these findings suggesting, uh, both from the Chronicle of Philanthropy and other statistics showing that individuals who make proportionally, or individuals, wealthier individuals, give proportionally less of their income to charity as compared to their lower income counterparts. But of course, we know that wealth does not always preclude generosity. Indeed, there are some exemplars, such as uh, Warren Buffett here, who has pledged to give 99% of wealth away over the course of his lifetime, and who spent a considerable amount of time and effort getting his billionaire friends to do the same through the giving pledge letters. So obviously, wealth does not necessarily predicate selfishness, leading to the question of under what condition, then, can wealth um, and in actually encourage charitable giving. So in order to examine this question, because Warren Buffett 
wasn't returning my phone calls in first year grad school. Uh, I did the next best thing. I turned to the Giving Pledge letters. So these were letters written by individuals who had made major contributions to the Giving Pledge program. And what we did was we coded these letters. So to begin to understand what kind of motivations are present among affluent individuals who donate pro large proportions of their, of their wealth to charity. And a key theme emerged. So uh, a few key themes emerged, but the key theme that I'm gonna talk about right now is this idea of wealth as responsibility. So the majority of individuals who wrote pledge letters reported that their wealth incurred this sense of responsibility to give back to society. And so when we ran subsequent studies, with major donors um, and affluent people that our alumni affairs office was trying to make affluent donors, uh, we found evidence that this sense of wealth as a responsibility positively predicted <coughs> the extent to which people made charitable donations and even predicted how positive people felt about paying their taxes. However, so I wanted to take these findings out into the world and explore whether we could change the way that people felt about their wealth and financial success in order to encourage generosity among those with the greatest capacity to give. So um, my first insight on this ongoing line of research is it's really hard to change people's minds. So despite the fact we spent a lot of time trying to encourage individuals to see their wealth and financial success in different ways, such as a responsibility to give back to society or as being situationally caused, we had a very difficult time leveraging these kinds of motivations to encourage charitable giving. So this led us to go back to the drawing board a little bit on this project and explore whether we might be able to find messages or appeals that are more effective. So again, kind of looking at heterogeneity here, that are most effective among those with the greatest capacity to give. Um, so the, there are findings suggesting in the social sciences, our lab's research and others, suggesting that wealth and even reminders of money can lead individuals to focus on their own needs and goals as opposed to the needs and goals of others, and also that wealth and money engender this sense of agency. However, charitable giving is predominantly a communal act, and therefore many message frames focus on what we can all do together to help. So we wanted to test the hypothesis of whether messages focusing on what you individually can do to make a difference, messages that are more focused on agency, might be more effective for the individuals with the greatest capacity to give. We've tested this idea across many studies, but one study that I'll share with you right now um, is a naturalistic field experiment conducted in, in the alumni office of um, a, an elite business school in the United States. So individuals during the course of this campaign received the agentic message frame or the communal message frame, and we tracked their actual donations over the course of um, the giving cycle. Uh, and what we found, so we found no difference on the, ex the likelihood of giving, but most of the individuals who made donations in this campaign had previously given in subsequent campaigns. But consistent with our predictions, we did find that alumni of an elite business school in the United States were more, gave more money when the messages focused on agency versus communion, and that these appeals were af differentially effective for individuals who lived in the highest zip code, highest income brackets in our sample suggesting then that agentic appeals are maybe more effective um, for individuals with the greatest capacity to give. So I'm now gonna talk about an ongoing project, but a project sort of related to this research that um, is in progress as of two days ago, <laughs> is we're also looking at one way to encourage giving among those who are more affluent. So there's this idea that we always think if we just had more money, then we would be more charitable. So when we start off uh, as graduate students like myself, you're like, oh, well, when I get my first job, I'm, you know, I'll be charitable then. But then people actually get their first job and they think, well, when I get my next promotion, I'm, I'll be more charitable then, and so on, and so on, which might contribute to the findings I talked about earlier. So one strategy that we're looking at or thinking about testing, very idea phase right now, is actually getting individuals to pre-commit some of their future bonuses, so employees that have an auto-enrollment program and uh, related to charitable giving, to pre-commit some of their future income to charity to help employees give more tomorrow so that they're giving in accordance with the money that they're, the raises that they're getting. Another project, so what's important to understand donor motivation and individual donor motivation and then try to leverage insights from our research in order to promote charitable giving, it's also important to think about how we can strategize ways in which to encourage charitable giving among those who might not otherwise make a charitable contribution. So how can we begin to get people to see themselves as a donor who might not already see themselves in this way? So an ongoing, and this is especially important in light of research suggesting that 
People today are less likely to see themselves as someone who cares about making charitable contributions. And in, in Canada, the rates of charitable contributions have actually declined in, in recent decades. So what can we do to get people to begin to see themselves as someone who cares about charitable contributions? So in an ongoing project, we're looking at the role of teaching others um, to change, to, to look to our own behavior to see ourselves as a donor. So in particular, in this project, we're capitalizing on parents' motivations to teach their children the values that they find important. So we're running some experiments right now looking at whether we frame charitable giving as a teachable moment, so have parents give together with their kids or make charitable donations with their kids present and you know playing in the lab but not actually with their children, whether this not only changes people's self-perceptions and seeing themselves as a donor, but whether it also has impacts on their actual charitable donation behavior outside of the experimental context. So yeah, um, I want to say uh, thanks. So I'm excited to have more discussions about these and other projects. Um, and yeah, look forward to, to chatting more about all of this. So thanks so much. We're giving up on the panel, by the way, because we can't do a panel in two minutes, so feel free. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if you've had um, opposite effects on people who earn less, because you could imagine if someone isn't you know, wealthy or even not even uh, median income, you could imagine that you think, well, I am one of the people who is deserving of, of more, maybe not even charitable giving, but more help from the community. Have you seen any of those factors? Yeah, so with regards to the agentic message frames, we do see a, a complete crossover effect. So the agentic message frames actually do seem to be less effective for lower income individuals, maybe because they don't feel like they have the agency to take on a, a big problem by themselves, or because maybe they feel deserving of help in some way. So we actually see agentic messages being most effective for higher income and less effective for lower income individuals in our samples. Todd, Todd, sorry. And okay. then. Uh, the, the parenting thing, I think, yeah. is super interesting. You, when someone makes a donation, they get a, a letter saying that uh, they've made a 501c3 tax deductible donation and file this away for your taxes. So there's like already a post donation communication with the donor. Yeah. I wonder if that would be like, if you could turn that into some. Tell your talk to your kids and have as a dependent variable renewed giving or whatever else, but have them have that be an opportunity to give a sticker to their kids as we're a giving family or, or yeah. some other. Yeah, so we're definitely looking for field partners uh, related to that research. So um, that's definitely an idea that we've considered and think would be really interesting to test. And I feel free to open it up to all of us if we're at the end of time. All right. yeah. Were there any other? Um, physical effects of the pro-social spending on others aside from the lower blood pressure over time? Like if you've done any longer term studies, I, I would assume giving $120 over longer than three weeks would be tough. But um, yeah. and, well, for example, did um, pulse decrease or anything like that? Yeah, so uh, in, our, in early days, like so maybe like the first three years of that project, we were also looking at cortisol and seeing, so that's a hormone related to stress, and seeing if that went down, but we didn't find any evidence that it did over the course of the study, and we didn't run longer term follow-ups. We did see that our effect is not explained by like increased exercise, so it wasn't just that people felt, you know, more pro-social and then therefore more active, and then they, you know, the blood pressure findings were being explain because of exercise. We didn't see that in our study, but it'd be interesting to follow up more on that. Yeah. yeah. What's your theory of like that basically? So like what's your theory of why it leads to lower blood pressure and charitable giving? Like is it, is it mostly that you think it's through like increased mood or have you got like a slightly more nuanced idea of what might be going on? Yeah, kind of so this is like the one study in which we did not show increased mood as a result of, of pro-social spending in part because older adults are more consistent in the way that they emotionally, Gosh. they report on their emotions. So we think it's probably just an artifact of the, or dif differences in the samples that we usually test. But we did find some evidence here of a stress buffering effect. So there was a positive relationship between the amount of stress that people experienced and blood pressure for people randomly assigned to spend money on themselves. And that association went away. 
um, for individuals randomly assigned to spend money on others. And that's consistent with a lot of research in health psychology showing that providing social support can be good for health in part by protecting you against the impacts of stress in your day-to-day -day -day life. So although we don't, didn't have a lot of statistical power to assess um, cause, like mechanism in our study, that's the best guess that I have based on the data that we collected. Some of the links among the different talks, and wondering about whether uh, people low in SES um, they are, uh, you know, more likely to be system justifiers. People higher on SES might be less likely to be system justifiers, and they also are aware of bureaucracy and how much things cost. In other words, overhead. So, like, I was wondering if you think maybe there's some kind of mechanistic link between these different ideas. Like, is it possible that low SES people give more because they don't realize how much of their money goes to overhead? That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just that, I mean, you know, it's just an interesting thing to think about. I mean, which I just, I mean, we haven't collected the data, but it's something where we're trying to figure out some individual like state characteristics associated with those that may, might pay more and less attention to those things. Therefore, like the people that might pay more attention would be more reactive positively to an overhead free donation opportunity. And so if we can collect some sort of state characteristics on them and then look at that, um, yeah. it's, an, it's an interesting one. Uh, we have one minute left, so let's thank Ashley again. <laughs> and then, um,